What's up, everyone? Welcome to the Metal Maniacs Podcast. I'm your host, Jay Ingersoll, and I'm here, as always, with my co-host. It's your boy, Ma, Jay. What's up, buddy? It's good to see you, man. I like How that shirt. Yeah, I do, too. I, I thought uh, it was pertinent for today. Yeah, I, I it like was, it. It was the relevant choice. It fits. I used to have one just like it. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't find the shirt I was looking for that we each used to have. I looked high and low for it. It's I, I can't imagine ever getting rid of it, but I could not find it. The Extreme Metal for Extreme People? No, the domination. Oh, shirt. domination one. Yeah, I could yeah, not I find that. it. <clears throat> I think I wore holes in mine. So mine had like perfect artwork still to the day. Like mm. it never wore out, I, and I wore it a lot. I guess I just didn't wash it much. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's the problem when it starts getting dried. You know. Uh, yeah. Shout out to the homies and dyes though. I'm wearing some dyes. Yeah, pain divine. Shout out to the boys. Yeah, pain so, divine. Thank t- you. Today we are going to do. And another bio episode has been a little bit since we've done one on a band. And today we are going to cover Morbid Angel. Thought it was fitting. Kind of go down the line of the bands that we thought are the most impactful with us. And Yeah, another uh, rival to death in terms of who started death metal. Who wears the crown? Who was there first? Um, and they go back to the start. Mm-hmm. So a lot of people are going to say it's Morbid Angel. And I'm going to respect that opinion all day. Uh, just preferential treatment to death on my side of things because it's you know it's it's the whole catalog it's it's everything all said and done end of day you know but uh definitely morbid angel was there in the beginning maybe even a little bit before death and in, in some fa- form or fashion you're gonna educate us on that i know today we're gonna get down to the bottom of it whereas death leaned and progressed in a progressive manner through death metal they really almost at the end you could say they were almost like thrash progressive even uh, there was almost like some power metal yeah. influence towards the oh, end, yeah. especially with the control denied obviously sure whereas morbid angel if you listen to the newest morbid angel besides their little blip in the radar that elvidium yeah Elvi- yeah Elvium something or other yeah I'd, i don't remember the name probably for purposeful probably. matters but uh <laughs> These guys have kept it death metal. Yeah. You know. Oh, they, by it. Yeah, for sure. You know, they've, King, they've evolved and grown in different ways, but they've always kept it to the death metal. Kingdoms of Disdain, I believe, is the most recent. Yes. And I own that one. It's and good. It, it still sounds like death metal. They yeah. didn't they didn't veer off in any form or fashion. And it, and it still sounds like good death metal. Yeah. So um, they have maintained what they do very well over the years. Yes, for sure. <clears throat> All right. So let's get into this. Yeah, yeah. Morbid Angel, the death metal legends hailing from Tampa, Florida, kicked off in 1983 with a trio of guitarist Trey Azigtoth. So we just went over that. In, I thought it was Ag- Azigtoth because there's a T-H-O-T-H. Right. Because we heard him say it. We heard looked him, it up. Yep, heard Azigtoth. Him say it. Yep, heard him say it. Heard David Vincent introduce him. Trey Azigtoth. Yep. Born George Emmanuel. So I'll just call him George Emmanuel or Jorge Emmanuel. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Right. George Emanuel III, March 26, 1965. Vocalist, bassist, Dallas Ward, and drummer, Mike Browning. These guys are some of the OGs of death metal, especially in the Tampa scene. Oh, yeah. Playing a pivotal role in shifting the genre from thrash metal roots into death metal. We have covered that in the death metal episode all the way back. I believe it was episode two. That was kind of our foundation as a podcast, so you can listen to that if you haven't checked it out. But this is where metal evolves, and these guys were on the forefront of it. Oh, yeah. One of the first bands on the scene pushing thrash to blast beats, the screams of thrash metal, Slayer-esque, to guttural vocals where they're the low, in-your-face, quote-unquote, cookie monster vocals. Sure. And the very dark and unique stylings of death metal. Morbid Angel was at the forefront setting the scene. Absolutely. As our aforementioned conversation, who kind of set death metal no one's really arguing the fact that death was on the forefront. Morbid Angel was on the forefront. Tampa, Florida yeah. was where it was happening, the scene, really. You the know? capital. Yeah. At least in the common eye, I guess you could say, right? Sure. I mean, there was extreme metal probably happening everywhere, but for reasons unknown, there was just a coalescence of metal happening in Tampa, Florida. Yeah, for sure. So they are often hailed as one of the biggest bands in death metal, amongst the heavyweights like Obituary Death, Cynic, Autopsy, Deicide, Cannibal Corpse. Mm-hmm. Those they're, they're bands, transplants, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, basically. So countless bands took the page from their book, giving them the most "quote unquote" influential and emulated title. So you always got to have somebody that's starting it, right? Right. 
somebody that's setting the stage and then there's a lot of guys that come after there's a lot of wannabe tools there's a lot of wannabe pink floyds there's a lot a lot of wannabe you know the bands that really set that sound in death obituary morbid angel those are some of them that everybody else after is just doing what has kind of already been done or at least brought to the spotlight right sure they even did the unthinkable by diving in the mainstream success back in 1992 when Giant Records scooped them up. MTV cranked their music videos on heavy rotation, and even Beavis and Butthead showcased the God of Emptiness video. Bow. So I remember that video specifically. I think that's even when I was introduced, maybe even before I was heavy into death metal, because I always watched the Beavis and Butthead, you oh, know. Yeah. But uh, I remember Beavis just doing that a bunch of times because you had the bow. <laughs> That's a great vocal. I just listened to it out in the driveway. <laughs> so their first three albums, Altars of Madness in 1989, Blessed Are the Sick in 1991, and Covenant in 1993, are like the holy trinity of death metal classics. Terrorizer Mag crowned Altars of Madness the kingpin of death metal albums, and Decibel Mag gave Trey Azikthoff the gold for death, it should say best death metal guitarist ever. I mean, that's early on in the game. I don't know when they uh, attributed that award to him or that title, but that's a pretty cool comment to have yeah. to, to read about yourself. Yeah. Like, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so the band's songs push complexity at times and even some, case, some cases cited as technical death metal. The technical skills of Azik Toth on guitar and drummer Pete Sandoval are heralded among the death metal community. He is also known from his early band, Terrorizer. And we'll get into that a little yeah, bit, Yeah, and I think Pete's footwork early on really set a benchmark for all drummers to follow. He would push himself to the limits of man, you mm -hmm. know, versus machine, basically, I think is how he got his speed to where he did. So uh, one of the best drummers in death metal early on, for sure. And that is, I will say that just as a caveat right now, that is one of the things that set these guys apart from, like, death when we mentioned death. Whereas Death's drums early in the beginning, thrash at best, mm -hmm. not very fast, double bass, right. not anything real technical. Obviously, that came later with Gene Hoagland and, you know, and Sean Reinhardt. Sean Reinhardt. Yeah. Um, but as far as like Pete coming onto the scene and Altars of Madness, like you're just like, holy shit. And we'll get into a little bit of uh, talking a little bit more about Pete here in a second. So, according to Nielsen Soundscan, Morbid Angel is the third best selling death metal band in the U.S. Cannibal Corpse and DSI take the lead until 2003. Their third album, Covenant, takes the cake as the best-selling death metal album of the SoundScan era, with a whopping 150,000 units sold, which is a banger for death metal. Yeah, I mean, those numbers look small compared to, you know, pop stars of today or or in an era where more units of CDs were sold because mm. now we're in streaming, so yeah. the, it's a different way of looking at um, a measurement of who's listening and how many people. But yeah, 150,000 units sold back in the day or up until this time is, is still a good number for a death metal album, in my opinion, I'd say. I'd be proud of that. Yeah, for sure. So Morbid Angel's lyrical content has taken many forms throughout the years. In the beginning, they were about Satanism, occultism, and anything blasphemous, mm -hmm. thanks to Vincent Azigtoth and OG member Browning. But then, Azektos' influence took them on a detour in the realm of ancient Sumerian gods. It's like a head nod to the semen Necronomicon hooked on Sumerian mythology, H.P. Lovecraft, and a dash of Roman Empire fascination. I think I was just reading that's where he got his name, too, H.P. Lovecraft's work. Oh, okay. That's, that's where the, the, the pseudonym comes in. <clears throat> With Steve, when Steve Tucker stepped in, the lyrical vibe got... Even wilder, anti-religious and barbaric themes with a spotlight on strong kicking the weak to the curb. Mm. Morbid Angel's mu music has also taken on some evolution, picking up different vibes along the way. Always with the harsh, growled vocals that were usually audible and distinguishable. Yeah. So I, I wrote that in there because if you kind of really listen, none of them got to that Cannibal Corpse toilet bowl type vocal right. where you're like, what the fuck is he yeah. saying? Like, if you really listen, there, a lot of this stuff was audible. Yeah. It was just at a lower register yeah. than Thrash predecessors, right? Yeah, I, and I have the distinction of attributing Morbid Angel to those low cookie monster growls. However, there's definitely uh, discernibility there, and mm -hmm. you can hear the words. You have to have an ear for it over time. Like, you have to, like, kind of be used to hearing that yeah. a lot, but 
going back and listening to these records, you can understand the words. Maybe I've read them so many times that mm. I just know them. Mm-hmm. I don't have to read them anymore. I can just hear what he's saying to me. Uh, and I think that's a good uh, attribute to have in a death metal band. Yeah, I mean, for sure. Because it's the biggest complaint among the masses. What are they saying? Well, mm-hmm. Morbid Angel's a good one to listen to where you can actually get the words without having to read the booklet. I also think with their lyrics, they took them so serious and that were kind of about that life, yeah. right? It's so to speak. Absolutely. That they wanted you to hear what they were saying because if it was just, you know, mumbling or blah, 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 you know, low as you can possibly go, I just don't think that would fit their, they almost had a message like, yeah. hey, we're here, we're satanic as fuck, yeah. we're, we're, we're doing this thing, yeah. you know? So... Trey is a great technical player. He mixes fast trend picking, low groovy palm muted riffs, and wild and complex guitar solos. Azek Toth is a guitar maestro, the beating heart of their sound, and has a distinctive style that is atonal shredding. Hmm. While melody right. does exist in the music, there's also a variety of chromatic, strange musical passages that occur throughout. So you can tell that he knows his stuff on guitar, right? You can tell that he's a shredder. You can tell that you're like, wow whatever you're doing is is pretty badass but there is also elements where it's just like yikes yeah it's just kind of like whoa what the fuck is that that doesn't make sense musically that does kind of make my ear feel weird yeah but in a good way you know almost like vitriol is right where it's just like wow like no melody but holy shit that just blows me back i his solos slayer-esque at times too with a wow and i'm like i know one of his heroes was van halen he always talked about that that was one of his guys he looked up to, his style doesn't really complement Van Halen's in any way, but at the same time, I understand the shreddiness. He is a great technical player, and just being able to play some of their riffs, super technical and really, really you know, badass stuff. So You would have to know that he was inspired by Van Halen to pick that up. Now, I was just listening to Covenant on my way here, and I got two things out of it. Um the the Slayer esque dive bombs mm-hmm. like the Carrie King scribbling all over the place no <laughs> it, out of the lines no <laughs> not even in the lines ever <laughs> entirely outside of the lines but hey if it fits the music and the yeah. other thing was there was a lot of melody with the tapping and so I did pick up I wouldn't say specifically uh, Eddie Van Halen but more the classical guitar influence and having him say that uh, that makes sense because I I could see that he also would you know, scale it back and play a melodic passage during a solo. So it wasn't always coloring outside of the yeah. lines. There is some phrasing going on. Oh, yeah. And I think that a lot of that tapping was more where the Van Halen thing comes in. You Absolutely. Know? So the drums, the drums, the drums. That's <laughs> what I have right here. So Hell Pete yeah. Sandoval, I say that name and drummers that are in this genre know that his name resonates with greatness behind the kit. Oh, yeah. This guy isn't any drummer. He's the backbone of the animal that he and Trey make up. Oh, yeah. He is widely known for his double bass drum speed and technical skills. He's earned his stripes as one of the demons behind the kit in death metal. Sandoval's also considered a pioneer, being one of the first to jump on the acoustic drum trigger bandwagon. So for those that don't know, we'll just put this out there. We may have mentioned this in the death metal episode. What a drum trigger does is when the beater hits the bass drum when you're on the kick drum, it sends a signal to a a device that will send a sound either into the recorder or into the PA. through the front house PA, whatever. Yeah. And the reason why it's done that's done in death metal, I know some people are like, wow, we know how to do this, but maybe some people don't understand. Right. When you do that, the speed of the kick drum actually gets picked up because a, a regular mic would just make that sound muffled. Yeah. It would just be a big muffled mess. Sure. So having that almost clicking or that specific sound that is triggered out, per se, makes it way more audible when you're playing this fast. And it's almost something that needs to be there in, when you get into these faster speeds yeah. of death metal. And I think there's a, a big misunderstanding or misconception of triggers outright in the beginning people oh you use triggers blah blah you know thumbs Mm. down on that you know i just think people didn't really understand what it was that the triggers were there to do and Mm -hmm. how they were there to serve the music triggers aren't there to supplant lack of skill in your drummer now they may for some drummers be the case 
you know, oh, you just hit the pedal one time and it does a quadruple it for you. Uh, I mean, I guess maybe some drummers do that or you just don't understand how triggers work or what they do. But the triggers are just there to clarify the bass work, the bass drum work, so that you can actually audibly hear it, with, as you say, without making just this big cacophonous noise in the PA. Yeah. So triggers are not a bad thing. Um, if you're if you're respecting your own art, you're probably looking at the best way to present that to people and then that you get equipment like this. And... You know, the new backing tracks are the new trigger, right? Sure. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> now people are bitching about the backing tracks where yeah. it's like, yeah, we could have the backing track play all of the parts and we could just kind of either go all the way from doing a karaoke style over it or yeah. we could just use it a little bit to supplement the song to add some of them additional production elements yeah. that are on the recording. So yeah. it's, you know, the backing tracks are the new trigger, right? Yeah. I and mean, that's because we bitch about... Well, I don't want to say we, but people bitched about triggers back in the day, and now we're bitching about backing track. You know, so it's always going to be something. But that's and, the way I look at it. And right? you have to ask yourself the question: Can the band afford to bring on a twenty piece on tour, or do are we just going to put some of that on the sample backing track? Are we bringing the horns and the brass and the strings on the road? No, we're not. We're yeah. doing like a one time off Metallica symphony orchestra thing if we can afford it, right. even in our hometown or what have you. Best of friends come out, bring your instruments. But if you're taking this show on the road. You're piping a lot of that into the PA just so that you can have the depth and the atmosphere required to present what you've written in the studio, what you've taken the time and care to craft for your fans, and you want to bring that out on the road. And that requires extra equipment and, you know, just extra care to deliver it to the audience. And so I think people need to come to terms with these things. Yeah, for sure. So in the beginning, Morbid Angel pushed boundaries both musically and lyrically. Altars of Madness was like a blast-in-your-face blasphemy. <laughs> 1993's Covenant is a more broader, anti-theistic vibe with lyrics that scream anger at the higher power. Okay. Domination made you think about history and the horrors within. Okay, yeah. Today, Morbid Angel's lyrics are like metal philosophy class, making you ponder life's mysteries. Trey Azictoth, the current lyricist, spilled his personal ideology in Formulas Fatal to the Flesh. It's blasphemous, sure, but in the non-traditional way that's more thought-provoking than downright evil. The band's come a long way, and they're still out here shaking the metal scene with their unique blend of chaos and intellect. Yeah, I got to say, I love the lyrics to Morbid Angel um, through and through, especially once you get to that domination and formulas fatal to the flesh content. They're really thought-provoking, and they're not just that straight-up satanic barbarism in your face, that Luciferian stuff. I mean, that gets tiresome. And I look at a guy like Glenn Benton, and I think, how many times can you write this same batch of lyrics, dude? But, I mean, if that's what... That's that's deicide, so we'll just keep it on, uh, on Morbid Angel. I like that they grew away from that, and they invented or found new ways to s still keep it dark, moody, and and give you something else to think about. Yeah, for sure. So, the beginning... Morbid Angel kicked off in 1983 down in Tampa, Florida with the aforementioned wizard Trey Azictoth and the powerhouse combo of drummer vocalist Mike Browning. In the early days, they were like the they were like the pioneers of the Florida death metal scene, paving the way for heavy hitters like Obituary Massacre and Deicide. In 1986, Morbid Angel recorded their debut album Abominations of Desolation. Abominations of Desolation stands as the demo album. Okay. Originally recording in May of that year, the band was dissatisfied with the final product. It wasn't until 1991 that these recordings surfaced, a decision facilitated by the band's record label, Earache Records, when they printed 10,000 copies. The 1991 album cover explicitly states its intended status as their inaugural full-length album, a vision unrealized at the time, thereby designating Altars of Madness as their official debut. Okay. The band initially promoting and recording the album under the this premise encountered a setback when Mike Browning departed in 1986 following a disagreement with Trey. Azek Toth in subsequent interviews clarified that Abominations of Desolations is more of an extended demo rather than a conventional album. So when we talk about Altars of Madness being the OG album, of course, they recorded the Abominations of Desolation at, beforehand, and we'll come to find out that some of these songs also surface on other things. They become other songs, so they kind of didn't trash all the songs, but we'll see that, I believe, all the way up into Formulas Fatal to the Flesh, oh. 
some of these uh, some of these songs riffs or whatever were reimagined in okay. different ways so if you say that oh well alters of madness isn't the original one that's why i bring up this abominations i'm always going to go to the horse's mouth on things like this if trey tells me alters of madness is their first album then alters of madness right. is the first album yep. and anything <clears throat> prior to that is a demo leading up to that yep so, despite its initial fate, the majority of songs underwent reworking and found their place in subsequent Morbid Angel albums. Noteworthy instances include Chapel of Ghouls, Lord of All Fevers and Plague, and Welcome to Hell, later renamed Evil Spells, which found a home on Altars of Madness. Unholy Blasphemies, Abominations, and Azigtoth, later renamed The Ancient Ones, found their way onto Busted Are the Sick. Angel of Disease surfaced during the recording sessions for The Covenant, and culmination saw Hellspawn later titled Hellspawn, which there's just no space. Oh, Hellspawn the Rebirth. There sorry. you go. Finding its place on Formula's Fatal of the Flesh. The lone exception to this pattern is Demon Seed, a track from these sessions that to date remains on recording for full length album. It's funny that you mentioned Angel of Disease making its way onto Covenant because when I listened to it this morning, I thought this has got a way older kind of a 80s rock vibe. And. I thought, is this a cover that I'm unaware of? I thought, because it just sounded way uh, glam rock to me, just the riffage and the beat. I was like, this is a little uncharacteristic, but I will say, t to that track's credit, I love the switch up in the vocal delivery on that track, particularly compared to the rest of the album. Um, they did a, a lot of good things vocally on that album, too, and they would grow from what they did on Covenant going forward, I thought. In 1986, David Vincent joined, replacing Michael Manson and Sterling Von Scarborough as vocalists and bassists, respectively. Fellow Terrorizer member drummer Pete Sandoval soon followed. The band made their debut in 1987 on the new Renaissance Records label. The 7-inch single, Thy Kingdom Come, was released in Europe in 1988, and Morbid Angel was preparing to make a profound universal statement in form of a lineup consisting of guitarist Trey, drummer Pete, and vocalist Dave bassist vocalist David Vincent, and guitarist Richard Brunel. Living together in several band houses, which also served as places for rehearsals, and pulling their funds together to purchase an old-school bus, which they converted into a tour bus. Awesome. <laughs> Morbid Angel hit the road on various underground touring adventures with the company of their mascot, head of security Pitbull, named Butch. On a shoestring budget and supporting only various demos, the band made its way to places such as New York and performed at the club's streets in the city, and Sundance on Long Island. With the help from friends in the band Immolation, they managed to get a side job painting and sh a shopping mall in upstate New York and help offset expenses on many off days in this particular shake-and-bake tour. Also, the band met with troubles when rolling through New Jersey and were pulled over and arrested simply for being in the wrong place at the wrong time. The bus was searched and the police found some most interesting and alarming things, which led them to holding the band for a while there in jail, including the dog Butch. <laughs> so I got that directly from Morbid Angel's biography. Okay. So it just says interesting and alarming things. I'm assuming some occult weird shit and whatever. I don't imagine. Maybe they had some drugs I mean, on them. I don't know. It doesn't so, say, but that's that's directly pulled from the MorbidAngel.com website's biography. So I thought that was pretty interesting. I'm just going to go ahead and guess drugs is probably not interesting or alarming. That yeah. would just be par for the course. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's the, you know, the sacrificial dagger. It's like the Necronomicon book copy. You know, yeah. it's all the weird shit Satanic that I read. Yeah. Bible. Yeah. yeah. I, that, that's the shit I wanted to know that was exactly what yeah. what it was. Especially <laughs> probably during Satanic Panic era where they're on a school bus. Dude's got long hair and and leather and we're in the satanic panic mode and i mean yeah they were uh, if that bus that was sense. yellow and looked like a school bus I'd, <laughs> and those dudes were on it i'd pull it over too <laughs> so, something told me it was black when, when they probably stole some black from their painting job yeah, but that makes sense yeah i'm just just yeah just yeah. venturing a guess yeah just entering a guess so fitting for the group consisting of a bunch of freaks, mm. Morbid Angel continued on their mission of death metal and was soon discovered by Mick Harris of Napalm Death, which led to their meeting in Digby Pearson on the recording contract with Eric Records. December 1988, the band went to Morrisau to recording in Tampa, Florida. On May 12, 1989, their first real album, Altars of Madness, was released, courtesy of Combat slash Earache Records. Altars of Madness, regarded by many as one of the most important death metal death metal albums of all time. Music journal 
vocalist Jason Birchmeyer writes that, quote, few albums struck a chord within the ears of the minds of the late 1980s underground metal scene like Morbid Angel's Altar of Madness did at the end of the decade, setting a new precedent for metal bands to reach, unquote. So just looking at dates here, this is one of the reasons why we kind of attribute death as the founders of death metal because even though morbid angel had put in so much work leading up to altars of madness just by virtue of the fact that death kind of beat him to the punch with the first major label debut in scream bloody gore I, that predates altars of madness i think that's part of the reason why we also can easily just say chuck was there first but trey had been out doing it since 1983 right alongside chuck it's just that the first real album didn't come out until after scream bloody gore so it's funny you say that because alters of <laughs> Mad- this next <laughs> sentence or the paragraph says alters of madness is a death metal trail but blazer paving the way alongside possessed seven churches in 85 mm-hmm. and death screams bloody gore in 1987 right these albums set the stage but alters of madness took it to a whole new level Fair. creating a benchmark for heaviness and extremity both in the music and the lyrics yeah i mean and they you're going to hear that too. Like there's a lot of development that took place within the band o- over that time from 83 to 89, where those albums by comparison, you're going to stand them up against seven churches and scream bloody gore. Alters is probably going to win your ear overall. I think it's a probably superior album. I felt that the transition, there was also more must to me, there was more of a jump from like Slayer to altars of madness where we're just like amping it up. Okay. Where, Death Scream Buddy Gore almost kind of had this more of a transitional progression, right? Where you could see where Scream Bloody Gore would come right after Slayer. To me, all of a sudden you're listening to Altars of Madness after Slayer, right? If you're just, we're kind of holding Slayer as like the pinnacle benchmark of sure. as fast as Thrash got, as heavy as it was before these bands yeah. came along, right? Yeah. That's kind of what we talked about before in the Slayer episode and the Death Metal episode. So, Scream Bloody Gore kind of fits like a puzzle piece right up against that Slayer, you know, being the end of that. Whereas I felt like this Morbid Angel kind of even jumped up a step further, if that makes sense, just with how much faster it was, how much more satanic it was. Death didn't really, death was more of the gore type metal. They didn't really dive too much into, uh, you know, a little bit with Evil Dead and things like that. But that was kind of more tongue in cheek. That wasn't sure. I actually believe this shit. I'm carrying around that dagger type shit like Morbid Angel was, you know, so. Like I said before, few albums resonated as profoundly within the ears of the minds of the late 1980s underground metal scene as Alters of Madness did by the decade's end, establishing a groundbreaking standard for metal bands to aspire to. With the debatable exception of Chuck Schuldner's band Death, never before had a heavy metal band propelled their lightning-fast guitar riffs and equally mesmerizing guitar solos into such chilling territory. While Venom and Slayer had redefined the boundaries of how closely a metal band could associate with all things malevolent in the early part of the decade, Morbid Angel elevated these to the realm of, I should say, elevated Venom to the realm of children's music in comparison to assaulting death metal sounds and blasphemous lyrics emanating from the Florida-based ensemble. So basically what Venom was doing is what they should have sounded like Morbid Angel Right, for for all that Venom was saying right. on the mic in their lyrics, yeah. they didn't sound like what yeah. the lyrics would reflect uh, mm. audibly. Yeah, they were kind of like a heavier Motley crew to me. Yeah. And then what Morbid Angel was doing and saying all fit, it was all par for yeah, the course. The, the music fit the lyrics in that respect. Yes. Frontman David Vincent's vocal style was shaped by the early English grindcore scene and Chuck Schuldner of Death, a fellow Florida... Floridian? Floridian, that's how you say that. The (laughs) album is distinguished by its exceptionally fast performances, intricate compositions, and technically demanding musicianship. Trey Azigtoth, the guitarist, cited psychedelic music, especially Pink Floyd, as a significant influence on his writing for the album. When crafting guitar solos, he abandoned traditional scales, opting to intuitively explore different areas of the guitar. Chromatic. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Reflecting on his mindset during the album's creation, Azek Toth expressed a desire to push boundaries and challenge other bands. He aimed to create music that would astonish audiences and make other bands, quote, run and hide, unquote. Yeah, yeah. Despite the intensity of his motivation, he acknowledged that it might not have been the most amicable approach. 
Back then, this is a quote from Trey, back then I really wanted to destroy everybody. I wanted to write stuff that would make other bands run and hide. And then I have a note here that says, we all know this feeling. Because if you're into extreme metal, it's one of those things where we just want to write the heaviest shit and heavier shit than everybody else or the heaviest shit we can write or technical because we've been in that boat before too, yeah. right? Yeah, you kind of take on a little bit of a competitive nature when you're younger to set yourself apart from every other band. And nowadays I know that if we're on a bill or we're all hanging out, it's we're all friends, we're all doing this as a community thing, and I'm going to watch every band and enjoy them. Back in the day, it was, it was a little bit more of a chip on your shoulder. You wanted to know that you were certainly better than every other band. No matter where you played in the lineup, you're going to be the best band on the bill that night. These days, I'm always going to play my best. You know, I'm always going to bring my best. But if the next band has just got superior musicians and they just have it dialed in better, I'm going to respect that. And yeah. I'm going to elevate my game after seeing that and not not feel any kind of way about it toward them. It's just all me. Mm -hmm. And that, But that attitude prevailed a lot back in the day, I'm sure. Yeah, with all young musicians, that's yeah. always a thing, right? Especially it's pushing like, a, a new genre. Yeah. So, And there's ego involved in all of this. Like, yeah, we like to create music, but at the end of the day, you want someone, somehow, some way, there's a little part of you that that little pat on the back, the adulation, oh, you fucking shred, oh, you're badass, that feels a little good because you know you put in the work. You yeah. know, I don't do it for that anymore. I don't give a fuck. I'd put a banner in front of me and say, listen to my music. Sure. Do we perform it well? I'm fine with that. Yeah. Right? Like, yeah. I, I don't live in that world anymore, but I'm right. also 42 going on 43 years old, so it doesn't really matter to me. Back in the day, I wanted to be like, yeah, I could play faster and better than all these local bands, at least around here. But then there's bands out there like Origin where you're not going to really reach that pinnacle unless you just sleep in your room with your guitar for fucking days and days and days yeah. you know and, and so, some people are just built different yeah it's oh yeah so it, it, there's something. like a natural talent and then if you add the practice upon that it's just like wow yeah you, you can know? take blue collar and push it as far as you can go with it and then others are just gonna have that and just they're gonna naturally have more skill set and it is what it is work as hard as you want kind of know your limitations only Batman cannot afford this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, exactly. Know your limitations. And, and once I kind of found my skill ceiling, and then I'd see another basis that's just going to always be superior to me, no matter how hard I try to approach their skill ceiling, it's just not going to happen for me. And that's when I say, yeah, I'm, I'm good. I can play all that I want within what I have. I don't need to be that guy. That guy's great and good for him. Right. So for me, I'm just going to know where I stand and just try to make the best music going forward. And that's a good lesson early on for people. Definitely work on your skill set. Find your ceiling. Know your floor. Always raise the floor up. Keep trying to push that ceiling a little higher. But also make some acceptances without being down on yourself or not being the world's best musician. There is no world's best musician. Just enjoy what you're doing yeah. while you're doing it before it's taken away from you. Yeah, there, there's a healthy competition with yourself also. You know, these bands that we speak of, of course there was competition oh, there. Yeah. Death metal's emerging. We want to be better than these bands. We're playing shows with these bands. Oh, you hear about death. They're around the corner. Chuck's pretty badass. Let me try to be better than him. Or So it's the same vibe, right? Right. But I feel like if you're having fun with it, you're challenging yourself to get better all of the time, and you're doing it because you love to do it, you're going to find music a lot more rewarding than you would just trying to be better than the next guy. Yeah. Because that also leads to, whereas now I feel like, especially us meeting these bands on the show and going out to shows, we go to shows and do things because we want to enjoy that band and the music. Back in maybe even the early days of Infinite Design, we only showed up because we wanted to be fucking be better than everybody. And that's <laughs> not a real good attitude to have because you're like, I don't even want to talk to these guys. It was a miracle we made friends with anybody because we're just like, hey, look at us. We're right. fucking shreds, you know? Right. But that always didn't work in our favor either. Right. That wasn't... We should have been cool with everybody and tried to make friends back then. Yeah. The few friends we did make, it was a miracle we did, you know? Yeah. But I feel like some of those relationships now have kind of blossomed and you know, especially on this podcast with like the Black Temple and Phantom and bands like that that, yeah. you know, we've we played with for years. So yeah, those, we're all in a different place now. But yeah, those yeah. those relationships have all come back around in a new way, a refreshing yeah. way. So back to this. The original Vinyl and cassette releases omitted Lords of All Fevers and Plague, later added as, as a bonus track on CD versions. The 2002 remaster, including remixes of three songs and a 2006 dual disc release, featured additional content. Earache Records remastered and reissued the album in 2011 and 2015, 
followed by a full dynamic remaster in May 19 or May 2016. A Digipack edition with a remastered sound and bonus tracks along with the Mortal Rights bonus clip was released on November 23rd, 2018. So, Altars of Madness, there was all kinds of remakes and remasters and remixes going on with this. I think a lot of that was how do we make money in this age of streaming, right? Yeah, and know your fans. If your fans are constantly saying, we want this as a vinyl, or we want this remastered, and it's lucrative, I see no problem with it. People have to accept that it's really, really hard as a musician out here. Like, like you don't find me hawking art because I don't, I'm not, it's not the way that I make my living. But if that's your living, and if the that's what the fans want, then listen to your fans and give them what they want, especially if you can turn it into a dollar. I see no problem with it. I don't look at it as selling out. I just look at it as, yeah, we can improve upon that. One more time, why not? Oh, you want it in vinyl remastered fully? You're like, fine. Like, bonus track. You got whatever. it. Yeah, exactly. It's fine. So we'll talk a little bit about the cover art here. So it was designed by Dan Seagrave. It portrays a flat disc made of a fossil material that has captured souls. Seagrave clarified that it was his first venture into death metal cover art and was not intended to be spherical, but rather a flat disc capturing souls made of fossil material. Despite creating it at the age of 18, he finds the artwork still quite interesting. Hmm. The album catapulted to the number one on the UK independent chart, solidifying the band's worldwide fan base. Morbid Angel embarked on an extensive tour spanning nearly two years in promotions of Altars of Madness. The journey commenced in November 1989, where they kicked off the Grind Crusher tour by opening for Napalm Death, Carcass, and Bolt Thrower in the UK and Europe, hmm. then continuing with Napalm Death on the Smash Teams tour throughout Europe. Okay. Throughout most of the 1990 and 91, the band crisscrossed North America using their converted school bus and still sometimes bringing along their pit bull butch, performing at many underground clubs and taking part in the epic Michigan Death Fest oh, wow. event, which even the local mainstream news p- took part in. I'm assuming probably to talk shit about it back then, <clears throat> like to say, look at all these satanic death metal bands coming along. What is this shit? Yeah, lock your doors, yeah. hide your wife, hide your kids. Yeah. <laughs> I thought it was cool because they mentioned the Michigan Death Fest. Could use another one of those. Oh, yeah. So they shared the stage with notable acts such as Pantera, mm-hmm. Obituary, Atheist, Death Angel, Forbidden, Sanctuary, Ripping Corpse, Deicide, Sacrifice, and Wrath. The Altars of Madness tour concluded in April 1991 with a tour of Brazil supported by... Sarcophago. Thank you. I'm always going to go to you on that one. Sex Trash and Cambio Negro. So we're talking, that was the end of Altars of Madness right there, kind of 1991. So in 1991, Morbid Angel released their second album, Blessed Are the Sick, garnering widespread critical acclaim and earning its status as a landmark release in the death metal genre. Although the album incorporates some fast-paced sections, its overall sound is notably slower compared to the debut, with discernible classical music undertones. The main composer, Trey, dedicated this album to Mozart. Tracks 9, 10, and 12 are re-recorded versions of the song from the 1986 demo, Abominations of Desolation, as we alluded to previously. The cover painting, titled Lost Tracers de Satan, is created by Gene Delville. In 2009, the album was reissued as a digipack in dual-disc format, the CD side features the original audio release, while the DVD side includes a one-hour documentary. This documentary can be found on YouTube, and it's called Tales of the Sick. and mostly chronicles the first album making and touring. I did watch this documentary. Okay. There isn't a lot out there on Morbid Angel, I will say. I had to dig pretty deep to find some of this stuff. You got your Wikipedia. Yep. I took a lot of this from their biography. I watched this DVD, which, like I said, is on YouTube. Right. It doesn't give you much. It's really David Vincent just talking and a few of, like, the tour manager, and that's about it. They don't even talk to anybody else really in the band, but they just kind of talk about their first tour and some of the stuff that they were doing in support of Altars of Madness. It's a cool little... You know, bonus DVDs and little video, anything you could get your hands on was always cool back in the day. But there isn't a lot of substance if you're really wanting to dive into Morbid Angel. Like, that could be part of your journey, but that's all it is, is a very small blip on what Morbid Angel offers. 
So all lyrics were penned by David Vincent, except where noted, and all music is composed by Trey Azekthal, with the exception of Desolate Ways, which is credited to Richard Burnell, the second guitar player at the time. Throughout 1991 and 1992, Morbid Angel embarked on a global tour in support of the album. This including a headlining European tour featuring Sadus, Cathedral, Godflesh, and Unleashed, followed by a North American tour, also supported by Unleashed, and another European tour with Entombed and Unleashed. Additionally, they participated as one of the opening acts alongside creator Sepultura, Headhunter, and Wolfsbane for Motorhead on the Christmas Metal Meetings 1991 tour. Morbid Angel also made their debut tour in Australia during this period. So they're out there hustling. Yeah. I mean, they were hitting the road. They were doing the thing, you know, so. That's how it's got to go if you want any any kind of success, even these days, is you got to get out there on the road and start slinging your merch and, and performing it to the best of your abilities before your fans. That's funny, all these bands that we talk about, all these bands were just kind of getting started at the time, and most of these all hold legendary status now, yeah. or these were the guys yeah, paving that, the way, you know. And that's because they just were on the road nonstop. <laughs> yeah. They're road dogs. So after the success of Altars of Madness and Blessed Are the Sick, Morbid Angel signed a deal with Irving Azoff's Giant Records for one album, with an option for five more. However, in late 1992, the band parted ways with second guitarist Richard Burnell due to alleged substance abuse. Instead of seeking a replacement, Morbid Angel continued as a three-piece. Covenant, Morbid Angel's third official full-length album, emerged from the depths of Florida's death metal scene. Unleashed on June 22, 1993, it found its way to listeners through Earache Records in Europe and Giant Records in North America. The album proved to be a breakthrough for Morbid Angel, securing its place in the annals of death metal history. This success was fueled by the band's contract with Giant Records and the extensive exposure garnering through MTV's Headbangers Ball. So just a note real quick before I move on to this. Sure. I read in the Morbid Angel biography, and I didn't add this into my... Actually, I, I would actually kind of like to read this from their biography, to be honest, before we get into this. So some of this might be reiterated, but I didn't add this. But it just says... So I'm going to read this directly from the Morbid Angel page. Okay. Covenant, the third album released in 1993, was a true milestone for underground metal community and remains to this day, being the first and only major label released by a death metal band. So that giant records deal... That was a major label. Okay. So I just wanted to put that in there as, as a note because it says major label released by a death metal band first and only. I don't know what that looks like now. Probably right. still not the case. Right. You know, a lot of these underground labels started springing up throughout the 90s and into the early 2000s, and they started becoming major to us, right? Major yeah. to the guys that liked metal, but they were, weren't a giant records, right? right? So... Notably, the music video for God of Emptiness graced the screens of Beavis and Butthead. Widely acclaimed as one of the greatest death metal albums, Covenant became a genre, la genre landmark, influencing a multitude of future metal acts, among them Portal and Dead Congregation, and so many more after that. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah, for that, sure. That's just a few we're mentioning. According to the Nielsen SoundScan, it stood as the best selling death metal album in 2003 boasting over 150,000 sales in the United States alone. Rolling Stone cemented its legacy in 2017, ranking as as a 75th best metal album of all time. And that's all metal. It yeah. did, no adjective there, just best metal album of all time. So that's a pretty high praise from, from anyone, even albeit Rolling Stone, who yeah. probably could give a shit about death metal or metal in general. But still, it's nice to be recognized no matter where, especially by such a high-profile uh, magazine, uh, or at least a, a magazine as popular as Rolling Stone. Yeah, when they don't give two shits about anything no. that's heavier than the Black Keys or, or whatever. I don't even know. <laughs> just some bullshit they cover. You might see a Pantera on there or something like back there in the day, you know? Maybe. So, the release of Covenant through Eric and Giant Records marked a pivotal moment in 1993, often recognized as the zenith of death metal. Morbid Angel's prior success paved the way for one album deal with an option for five more with Giant Records, a subsidiary of Warney Brothers Records in the spring of 1992. So, yeah, yeah we got that part. Yeah, I was going to say that must have just been a little... Crafted by... Uh, da, 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 da. Yeah, okay. Crafted by David Vincent, the album's lyrics delve into the occult, mythological, and satanic themes, including theistic Satanism, Sumerian religion, and 
Nietzschean philosophy. Nietzschean philosophy. Nietzschean. Nietzschean. Michael Nelson, writing for Stereo Gum on the album's 20th anniversary, praised the band's success in musically reflecting these themes, particularly highlighting Trey Azektal's distinctive guitar work, describing Azektal's guitars as mirroring surreal na- natural horrors. Nielsen emphasized the departure from the technical prowess of its contemporaries. The quote, Covenant stands as a rejection of the mainstream musical conventions lacking traditional choruses, embracing complex, ever-changing time signatures. Nielsen further characterized it as non-catchy record with uppermost layers of sound that captivate the ear and imagination, leaving little room for grooves. I don't agree to that. Uh, no, neither do I, but there is not a whole lot of groove on this album, but I'm going to tell you, World of Shit and God of Emptiness sure do bring it, and... Maybe with the groove, but not catchiness. Oh, yeah, there's catchiness all over that album. Um, I've got things to say on this album. When, when we're done entirely with Co- Covenant, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give a couple of things to uh, a couple of opinions of my own here, but I'm going to let you bring it all the way through for us first. Sure, we'll, we'll bring it through. Produced by Morbid Angel and Fleming Robinson, with engineering by Tom Morris and Fleming Robinson, Ross Musson. Ross Musson at Morris Sound Recording in Tampa, Florida, the album attained a meticulous touch. Fleming Ross Musson, renowned for producing Metallica's iconic albums, including Ride the Lightning, Master of Puppets, and Injustice for All, was chosen for his different approach and meticulous attention to detail. The track Angel of Disease, originally penned in 1985 for Abominations of Desolation, found new life on Covenant. Notably, Rapture, the album's opening song, set the thematic tone, while the closing track, God of Emptiness, stemmed from a vivid dream, materializing as a spontaneous creation in the dead of night. The album's cover, featuring a page from the Book of Ceremonial Magic by Arthur Edward Waite, and the Pact of Urban Grandeur, Grandeur. Grandeur? Yeah, sure. marked a departure from il- illustrated covers. Created in a collaboration collaboration with photographer Martin Nisbet, the cover aimed to convey solemn commitment reflecting the album's philosophy. Giant Records and Warner Brothers Records threw their weight behind the album, commissioning music videos for Rapture and God of Emptiness. Directed by Tony Kuhnwalder, these videos received heavy rotation on MTV and Headbangers Ball. Tragically, Kuhnwalder's untimely death and a fire... Jeez. Following the God of Emptiness shoot added a poignant note for the album's narrative. That's wild. That's tragic. In the celebration of the 20th anniversary in 2013, Covenant underwent remastering and a full dynamic range edition, re-released on CD and vinyl by e Records in November of the year. After the album's commercial triumph and extensive exposure on MTV, Morbid Angel embarked on a notable tour with Black Sabbath and Motorhead in early 1994. It's fucking huge. Yeah, that's insane. <laughs> For Morbid Angel, yeah. that's incredibly huge. Spanning over 20 dates, the tour kicked off on February 8, 1994 in New Brighton, Connecticut, and concluded on March 13, 1994 in Sunrise, Florida. With Morbid Angel supporting Motorhead throughout, David Vincent attributes a pivotal role to Covenant in the band's journey. Quote, we got support from MTV and to tour with Black Sabbath and Motorhead in early 1994 in places we had never played before while a new wave of aggressive music was coming out. I think that overall it has helped us reach a whole new audience. Without Covenant, we wouldn't be where we are now and we are proud that has stood the test of the time like it did. It still holds up. In 2013 and 2014, the band took center stage in North America and European tours commemorating the 20th anniversary of the album's original release. Each tour date featured a complete performance of Covenant, followed by a selection of tracks from the band's other albums. Widely acknowledged as a milestone in the death metal genre, Covenant marked a pinnacle of its evolution. The album's sales were unparalleled, especially for a band and genre known for the relentless extremity. Morbid Angel's success, particularly with Covenant, led Columbia Records to sign numerous other bands from, from Earache Records, including Carcass, Entombed in Napalm Death, all aiming to replicate Covenant's triumph. However, none of these albums matched Covenant's success. The subsequent albums for these bands fell short, leading to Columbia severing ties with them within three years. Morbid Angel, despite their following album on Giant Records selling around 70,000 copies, also faced being dropped from the label's roster. Yeah, what do they know? (laughs) 
Kind of makes sense, though, because we had talked about that in the Carcass episode as yeah. well, because they signed with Columbia Records, you know, as a part of Eric Records, and that's why that was only for that one album, right? Heartwork, wasn't it? Uh, I believe it was actually Swan Song. Swan Song? Um, it, it's weird. It's I believe it was after Heartwork. Because Heartwork is still Earache Records, but I'd have to I'd have to be a hundred percent sure. I I feel like um, they signed them on the back of Heartwork's success and maybe distributed it. I I I'd have to reinvestigate that. But Swan Song was supposed to be the the major label debut for Carcass. <clears throat> so this period witnessed a seg- stagnation in the death metal genre, attributed to a lack of innovative bands. The industry's pursuit of mainstream appeal clashed with the anti-mainstream ethos that birthed and nurtured the genre. The emergence of Norway's black metal scene is seen as a direct response to the brief mainstream success of death metal, particularly attributed to Morbid Angel, creating a violent negative reaction within the genre. If you want to hear more about that, go listen to our black metal episodes. Because yeah. we mentioned that in there, but that makes a little more sense because some of these bands were getting signed to major labels. So that's why Euronymous and those guys were like, ah, Death Metal is mainstream because they had one record signed on a mainstream level. But that, sh- that should have been more of a, oh, that's pretty cool. But we know how the black metal community was back then. So by late 1995, Death Metal entered a decline, re- retreating into the underground. Yet Michael Nelson contends that this retreat revitalized the genre, allowing it to coexist and cross-pollinate with black metal comfortably. In 2017, Rolling Stone acknowledged Covenant's enduring impact by ranking as the 75th best album all time. We already said that. But. Okay, so I'll jump in right here. First of all, um, you are correct. Heartwork, the fourth studio album by the English extreme metal band Carcass, is the band's only major label release. It says released by Eric Records and then by Columbia Records after that. So I don't know how swan song i got convoluted with this but um it, i think it's just because they went back and forth yeah. between columbia and erie and that sounds the most mainstream <laughs> touche really so <laughs> with respect to covenant now this album's a little problematic for me personally because it it, it comes into scope after domination for me again mm. domination was the most recent release at the time for me and i absolutely love that album and so to go back to covenant for me you obviously you know, you're seeing like what would appear to be a regression, mm. but it's actually a progression from Covenant to Domination. The problem I have with Covenant is that snare drum. I, I don't know what the well, like. Nobody listened to this thing. It just sounds like it's rattling, and it's the volume is so high on this snare drum, and it's just Pete's a great drummer, but I, it really felt like the drums were way up in the mix for mm. me. And other than that, like. It's a little bit. It it feels a little bit jilted, or or what what have you, and I think that just goes to the way that they record, like not using a click track and everything, just a little bit raw for them, um, and also comparing it to Domination, really not fair because Domination is a whole other animal, which we're about to talk about. But uh, you know, the album is probably way better than the first two, right? Alters and Blessed. So it just depends on what side of things you're coming from. A progression, obviously, from those two albums, but they're about to make a huge leap going forward with Domination. And I don't have any complaints about Covenant. It's just that for me personally, it doesn't hold up to Domination. It holds up over time. It's got some great tracks. I'm like mm. 50-50 on it. I can jam some of those bad boys. Yeah, I know. I'm waiting for this thing to fall off. Maybe so is it <laughs> Stop. Tightened up or... Somewhere, somehow. That part's good. It's just this up here, I think. Probably We're good. We're good. It. But, I mean, yeah, again, it's just a matter of perspective. I, I think you can listen to Covenant and say it's their best album, and I'd respect that. But to me, it's domination all day, and it has to do more with the things that they brought into the fold. Uh, Eric Rutan and just the production level was way, way increased. Yeah, if I remember correctly, I did listen to a lot of these albums when I was writing this biography. And there is a hell of a lot of reverb on that snare, so it just sounds like it's like... Yeah, and like, then the other something. thing is, 
for this album overall is I feel like they were sponsored by some flanger pedal. Like, it, oh. it's just, <laughs> like there's, I feel like there's flanger on the cymbals. Yeah. I feel like there's flanger on vocals, and there's flanger on the guitar work. So there's just like, and a lot of that panning, if you're listening to the headphones, mm-hmm. you're going to hear that swirling of the flanger as you're listening to it. So flanger, really popular back in the early 90s, yeah. I feel like. Yeah, for sure. A uh, few more things just to note on Covenant that I'd like to throw out there. So I said they became a three-piece, and that was mostly what happened in the studio. But this is when they started touring extensively and enlisting live guitarist Eric Rutan in the European dates, including a run sharing the stage for the first time with Cannibal Corpse. So this is kind of where Eric Rutan started coming into the mix right. with Morbid Angel. And... uh. In the video for God of Emptiness, Trey started using a, a seven-string guitar. Huh. So we said before where that was kind of made popular in, you know, like the new metal. Yeah. That kind of thing. Well, Trey started using a seven-string here. So he was really kind of setting the standard, but he just didn't play it like with them low, groovy, like new metal slash now deathcore type things. He wasn't even playing in that. Right. But he had enlisted the seven string through this, so that so, I guess that was that thought that was just a very interesting note to put on there that he was playing a seven string. I don't know. It, in in my research, it doesn't say he recorded with it, right? But I'm assuming he did if he played it in the video for God of Emptiness. So he must have been playing a seven string in some of that. So interesting. Yeah, I think we're gonna move on here through Domination and really speak to that album, and then we'll probably stop around Formulas and make this a two parter. So okay. So, just coming off of Covenant, we spoke on that. Now, this is the album that really kind of set the stage for us. We've talked about this album a few different times on this show. If you want to go back and listen to another episode of ours, top five death metal albums, extreme metal albums, has both made our top five. Yep. We really hold this album in high regard just because these were the kind of things we were listening to when stuff came out. Yep. We're not these young kids that get this, the uh, Lorna Showers and these bands that are just pushing things to the next extreme, right? Right. That's the only reason why that stuff doesn't make our list. It's all great stuff, but this is the stuff we grew up on, right? Yeah. So yeah. the band released its fourth studio album, Domination, on May 9th, 1995, which featured new guitarist Eric Rutan of Ripping Corpse, also frontman of Hate Eternal, on guitars and keyboards. Rutan's tenure with the band was short-lived, and he departed after the album, but would later make a return for Gateways to Annihilation. Okay. It proved to be a somewhat controversial album among fans, featuring a slower, more atmospheric and experimental sound than on the previous albums. All music describes the album's sound as a more groove-oriented. The album has gone to sell over 100,000 copies in the United States alone, regardless, following the release of the album, the record label dropped them from the roster. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> How dare you? Yeah. That's the best thing they could have offered. Subsequently, Morbid Angel returned to their former label, Earache Records. Notably, Domination Stands is the first Morbid Angel album to showcase Eric Rutan. The CD cover mirrors the theme with an image of statues in a desert, maintaining a consistent visual style. Early editions of the CD were packaged with a distinctive green jewel case. I missed and an, that one. An initially planned limited edition slime pack never saw the light of day due to leaks before shipping, coupled with the discovery that the slime substance was toxic. <laughs> <laughs> now it's just in the ocean somewhere. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Accompanying the album was a music video for the track Where the Slime Live. Oh, great song. In 1996, shortly following the launch of their live album titled Entangled in Chaos, David Vincent parted ways with Morbid Angel. His departure marked a significant transition for the band, and in 1997, Steve Tucker stepped in as his replacement. The band, now with Tucker, unveiled their fourth, or their fifth full-length album, Formula's Fatal of the Flesh, in 1988. The release garnered attention for its heightened aggression and complexity compared to the preceding album, Domination. So I, I know, go ahead, buddy. No, you first. Oh, okay. I, I know we had talked about Domination before. We've talked about it. Yeah, quite a bit. You can go back and see some of our other thoughts on it, like I said, on the other episode, one of our earlier episodes. But just to speak on it here, I think the chaos and the 
atonal structure of some of this other stuff and a lot of stuff throughout the days. We we like that groove. We like that melodic. Mm-hmm. That's just something that you and I have always kind of grown to love. Yeah. Even our when we talk about Carcass, one of our favorite yeah. bands, or Death, it's all their more progressive groove-oriented melodic stuff that we like. That's just kind of what we like. That's and, what resonates with us. It's not so far out there yeah. that you're like... I'm fucking true cult or true yeah. death metal because I listen to the most obscure shit that sounds like garbage and it's all weird and atonal. Like, yeah. and there's, if you enjoy that, cool. Yeah, that's just not how what we enjoyed. We still liked our Megadeth and Metallicas and the stuff that brought Anthraxes yep. that brought us up and gave us that melodic and that song structure. Yeah. So when we put Domination on such a high, re, you know, pedestal, yeah, is because that gave us death metal. With those elements, yeah, fair. It, it was it was music that you could understand. It had structure. It had the melody. It had the production. It had the groove, and it you know it was elevated compared to their prior works even, and it made sense to us as you know you could say all right whatever's on the radio fine whatever they got their verse chorus verse well we got our verse chorus verse over here and we just like it because it's darker heavier minor tones and it was. We had the appreciation for it, and all of these bands were putting out, like, their best work at that time, and we would kind of go back and say, oh, you know, they came from Rika Putrefaction, or they came from Altars of Madness, and now they're here. Well, this is obviously way superior work, and it's what they're doing present day. So we put it on such a high pedestal because I feel like it would fit anybody who likes music. If you like music, and you like heavy music, or you're willing to embrace the mood of such heavy music... It would make sense as music, as a music listener, and it's not all of this chaos and noise and just grinding blast and, you know, vocals you can't understand. I think with if people give certain albums the time to appreciate them, they would take what we're saying is, Oh yeah, they're on they're on point here. Like this is this has got structure. I can understand what's going on here. And that's why we we put these albums on such a high pedestal because to me, it's just more music. You know, Megadeth was heavy. Morbid Angel was heavier. Yeah, right. <laughs> and, it, and it was still music. It still had an introduction and, and a verse chorus, you know, even a bridge segment. And, you know, I just felt like it, it made sense to me at the time. It just clicked. And for all of the reasons, the melody was there. They, they abandoned some things. And I just don't hear the chaos in Trey's mm. guitar solos. Yeah. I, you know, and Eric Rutan, he might have brought a lot to the fold with the production and songwriting, and that might have had a, a huge impact on what Morbid Angel was doing in that moment. And it it stands apart from everything else. It's way elevated compared to Covenant. It's a huge leap up from Covenant. Covenant's great as an appetizer, a little precursor to domination. And you can see that as I was listening to it this morning, I was like, oh, this has got some... I could see where they were going with how they would get to domination from here. The songwriting was already there. The groove was coming into play. Mm. Changing up the vocals a little bit was, you know, from God of Emptiness and um, what was the other one, the the remake that they did? Anyway, the vocals were changing in ways that... Angel of Disease. Yeah, Angel of Disease. Yeah. You could hear new vocals, and it, it gave it a much more robust sound and mm. more diversity within... So I think that Domination still, I'm going to stand on it always as one of the best albums in metal all time. For sure, my favorite Morbid Angel release, and I do like some other Morbid Angel for sure, but it it's just, it's in a whole category of its own. It's not just the best Morbid Angel album, in my opinion. It's one of the best albums in metal of all time. Yeah, I and, agree. And, uh, it, and if people listen to it, I would hope that they would share that opinion or at least see where I'm coming from and appreciate that because they really knocked it out of the park with that one. I mean, production's great on it too. Yep. Sounds really good. Yep. Still holds up. Yeah. For me, I say a lot on this show, I want to hear song structure. Mm-hmm. And I'm telling my own story on this show as people listen to this podcast. Yeah. Inadvertently. Because now you can see why I want song structure. Yeah. Because I love the Carcass Heartworks. Yeah. I love the death symbolics. Yep. We can still be heavy. We can still be technical. I love the Morbid Angel Dominations. We can still have low groovy, but give me something that you're writing good enough to pull back some of these parts for me. Yeah. Write me some vocal patterns. Yep. So when you hear me bitch and complain all the time about vocal patterns, if you're still listening to the show, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but this is why. Yeah. Because this is what I was brought up on. This was the stuff that really spoke to me in some of the best ways. So I agree, Domination... 
one of the best albums of all time. That's why it made our top five. And when we had to pick top five of all time, it's not an easy list to make. Nope. But it was easy to put that yeah. album on there. Yeah. Which is kind of weird that they got dropped by their label and all these other things happened. Maybe it was just the decline of death metal at this time. And, you know, 97, 98, David Vincent leaving the band. So you're kind of in this weird situation, but still a great album. We're just going to keep moving on if you don't mind. Yeah, no, I'm yeah, cool with it. I mean, I mean, if we get it done, we get it done. I mean, we're about halfway through right now. We could at least talk to formulas and then see where we're at. I, so all that being said, we can throw that all in the toilet now <laughs> because for me, love domination. Yeah. Morbid Angel could do no wrong at this point. Oh, man, I was so excited for this Until I album. bought this CD. Oh, God damn it. <laughs> It doesn't make sense. <laughs> make it make sense. Yeah. I, I'll try. So, Formula's Fatal to the Flesh stands as the fifth full-length studio album by the death metal band Morbid Angel. And before I even move on, I've seen other people say this is their favorite Morbid Angel album. I've seen other people hold this album in a high regard. Yeah. Music's subjective. You don't have to fucking listen to us. Yeah. We're just out here creating a podcast because we want to talk about metal. So take it or leave it. I, it doesn't matter to me. Yeah. If it's your favorite, cool. To me, it's one of my least favorite things I've ever purchased. But I will have to say, I'm going to have to go back and re-listen to it and give it a fair shot again. I just know comparing this to Domination and what I like to hear, this was so far out in left field, I didn't even know. This didn't even. This sounded like Morbid Angel like on fucking methamphetamines. I didn't know what the fuck was going on in this album. I, I know that they, they went headlong into the HP Lovecraft content down to the like the language we used to make fun of whatever the hell those words were mm -hmm. well that comes from the hp lovecraft world okay. and we didn't know that at the time and we were just like oh my god they've gone way off the deep end i have no idea what these lyrics are and this music does not make sense compared to domination it was just chaos revisited and it was hard for me to listen to that and say oh you know this is another great Morbid Angel album. I, I thought that they had kind of, re I don't want to, I guess regressed or at least gone back to some older elements that were maybe on Altars or maybe on Blessed, but they did not fit with Covenant and Domination and they did not make sense in terms of a progression. It was more like a veering off and, we're, nope, we're going to do something different and, and more chaotic and less control here. Might have had something to do with Steve Tucker. I don't know. <laughs> I, I do want to say this, too. Just a fun note about Morbid Angel, if you haven't been paying attention or don't know this. Each one of their albums starts with an alphabet. It all goes in alphabet. So Alters of Madness, Blessed Are the Sick, Covenant, Domination. And then you're like, well, what about Formulas Fatal of the Flesh? Well, that live album in 1996 yep. is Entangled in Chaos. Yep. So now we're at Formulas Fatal to the Flesh. So yep. we're on F. Yep. So as I said, it stands as the fifth full-length studio album. So you guys can replace Sesame Street with Morbid Angel yeah, and all. Yeah. <laughs> it's a good way to learn. Teach your kids that. <laughs> hey, little Johnny. What's F stand for? Yep, formula is fatal to the flesh. You're right. Good job, Johnny. <laughs> <laughs> You're getting it. That's an A or an F. No, the, no, uh, no. E is entangled in chaos. Thanks, Johnny. <laughs> So, departing from the satanic theme lyrics of their previous albums, this release introduces a shift to narratives centered around the old ones, a theme that would dominate Morbid Angel's lyrical content thereafter, including some lyrics written in Sumerian. Yeah. Notably, this album marks the debut of singer bassist Steve Tucker taking over for David Vincent. The title of the album, Formulas Fatal to the Flesh, alludes to the biblical symbol of the Antichrist. The clever use of the letter F, the sixth letter of the alphabet, gives rise to the interpretations to formulas being six, fatal being six, to the flesh being six, or simply 666, representing the number of the beast. I didn't know that until... It's it's funny that they're steering away from some of the satanic-themed imagery, but they're still tying it in as if to say, we didn't abandon it entirely, we're just moving on with it in new ways, and, and being a little bit more... Maybe being trying to be a little bit more clever about it. So in terms of tunings, Formula's Fatal of the Flesh maintains the E-flat tuning for six-string guitar songs consistent with Covenant and Domination and introduces B-flat tunings for seven-string guitar songs. Departing from the melodic tones of Domination, this album is renowned for its increased brutality and power. It features rapid drum tempos, extremely fast blast beats, aggressive riffs, 
atmospheric solos and more demonic vocal delivery from Steve Tucker. Noteworthy is the track Invocation of the Continual One, a compilation of unused music composed by the band in 1984, rearranged and, re rearranged and re recorded for this album. Interestingly, it stands out as the only Morbid Angel song where Trey Ezekthal takes on all vocal duties. I did not know that. I remember that when I, because I was such a Morbid Angel freak, I remember him doing all the, I was like, why do these vocals sound different? And I think it's actually noted in, in the book itself. I'm so. sure. Upon its initial release, the album received mixed critical reviews, but its retrospective reception has been overwhelmingly positive. Recognized as landmark in the evolution of brutal death metal during the late 90s, Formula's Fatal to the Flesh has secured a lasting and influential position within the genre. All songs on the album were written and arranged by Trey, except for Ascent Through the Spheres and Hymnos Rituals de Guava. Guava. Guerra. Gua I gotta roll the R. Gua I can't do it today. Yeah, I, Gua try, I try. There it is. Guerra. Sorry, guys. Sometimes I can, sometimes I cannot. Which are credited to Pete Sandoval. <laughs> Okay. Under Tucker's leadership, Morbid Angel continued to make strides in their musical journey, delivering Gateways to Annihilation in 2000, which represents the sixth studio album by the band. So just just on that, I know we talked about formulas just real quick on that. I'm going to have to go back and listen to it or try to listen to it. I just remember this was just, just an assault on my ears, and I just was like, what the fuck is going on? The production yeah. wasn't good. It seemed like there was 400 songs or something on here. I, it was like long as shit. I was just like, what is even happening? I don't even understand yeah, one we, bit of this. We might have to give it a fair shake. Yeah. But I, I think it was just jarring for us also because the departure of David Vincent was somewhat notable. You want to pretend like, oh, just anybody can do that, and Steve Tucker is... David Vincent 2.0. He's not, but no. he's he's a badass anyway. I'm, no diss on Steve Tucker right. whatsoever. And bless that man for continuing on with the Morbid Angel that we want and know and love. Mm -hmm. Because I think, to me, Steve Tucker embodies Morbid Angel more than David Vincent. Mm -hmm. And no diss on David Vincent either. I think he's made it pretty clear over the years that his taste had changed. And he wanted to kind of grow apart from death metal and do other things. He was in his wife's band for a while, mm. and you know, and you know when David came back into the fold, you could feel that, you could hear that, and the album that they released with him, and you could see that no, this isn't going to work with Dave anymore. We yeah. we got to have Steve in the fold, and and they made the right choice by keeping Steve Tucker as the vocalist to this day, and um, uh, I I have nothing but respect for him as I think he holds it down the way I want it to be held down in more in Morbid Angel. Yeah, I think he's the man. So under Tucker's leadership, like I said, they they released Gateways to Annihilation in 2000. The album marks a departure from the speed-laden intensity of its predecessor, Formula's Fatal to the Flesh, embracing a slower, more droning style reminiscent of the earlier Blessed Are the Sick and Domination. Okay. Notably, this release stands as the first where Steve Tucker contributes both lyrics and music to the band, showcasing a shift in creative dynamics. Additionally, Gateways to Annihilation is the second and final album featuring Eric Rutan as a member of Morbid Angel. The album was produced by Jim Morrison again from Morrison Studios. So just a little heads up on that. This is where it shows where you, when you alienate fans or you put something so out in left field where guys can't get into it. I wrote off Morbid Angel forever after Formis came out. I just thought they were going to be shit forever again, right? Right. Took me years. I mean years. I'm talking early Infinite Design days, 2000. 10, 11, 12, okay. where Adam was like, you never heard Gateways to Annihilation? I said, nope. <laughs> <laughs> it's it, Never listened to it. And then he real. let me borrow it, and I was like, wow, this is fucking good. Yeah. Was, so it just goes to show that maybe give some of your favorite bands a second chance after a while because they yeah. might be putting out some good shit that you didn't know about even if you wrote off one bad album. Yeah, I did the know. same, and I didn't come around for even later than that. I didn't make it my way back to Morbid Angel until their last release, Kingdoms of Disdain. I oh, was okay. just like, um, and to my to my credit, I was you know I was moving on to other things anyway. But at the time when I found uh, Kingdoms, I was like, okay, I needed this. I needed this again in my life. I needed yeah. good Morbid Angel, and that's what I got out of Kingdoms. You never heard Gateways then? Nope. All right, that's a good one to jam. It's yeah. cool. It's reminiscent of the domination, the blessed are the yeah. sick, the groovy song structure again, especially after formulas. Yeah, it's and it, again, it's not to disrespect Morbid Angel or not to sit here and say I had totally abandoned them, but also I felt like I have heard quite a bit of Morbid Angel in my life. So mm -hmm. a new Morbid Angel, you know, it's like 
do I want to hear another Morbid Angel album or do I want to hear an entirely new band doing something fresh and new? And that's mm. kind of where I, I tend to lead myself always looking for the new, new thing, thing so that I can kind of stay young, if you will. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah. I get it. So Human nature. Yeah. The album cover, pa- painted by Dan Seagrave, so he, he's back in the fold too, holds significance as the first Morbid Angel album cover he crafted since Alters of Madness. The introductory track, aptly named Kawazu, draws from an archaic Japanese word signifying frog. This choice of title aligns with the sounds of frogs croaking that grace the title track, adding a unique and cultural dimension to the album's atmosphere. I am intrigued. In 2001, Tucker temporarily left Morbid Angel, leading to the recruitment of Jared Anderson, formerly of Hate Eternal, as the bassist and vocalist. During this period, the band participated in an extreme steel tour of the North America alongside Pantera, Scrape Slayer, and Static X, a notable event that, as it turned out, to be Pantera's final major tour. Oh, wow. I did not know that. No. So Jared was playing bass during that tour, so I had no good idea. on him. I Should. had no idea any of yeah. that occurred. However, in 2002, Anderson departed from the band, promoting Tucker to resume his role as both bassist and vocalist for Morbid Angel. This period represented a dynamic chapter in the band's history, marked by lineup changes and continued commitment to pushing the boundaries of their music expression. In 2003, the band released Heretic as the seventh studio album by the Florida death metal band. Notably, this album marks their final collaboration with Eric Records. As the band opted not to renew their contract, additionally, Heretic is the last album to feature Pete Sandoval and Steve Tucker until the latter's return of 2017's King of Disdain. Recording at Diet Worm Studios under the guidance of Juan Gonzalez, Heretic diverges from the band's tradition by being the first album not recorded at Morris Sound Studios. Or I should say, at Morris Sound Recording. The album includes the second track, Enshrined by Grace, featured on the Texas Chainsaw Massacre soundtrack, mm. accompanied by a music video that received substantial airplay in the months following the album's release. The track gained notable recognition. Now vocalist, guitarist, Carl Sanders contributes the outro guitar solo for God of Our Own Divinity, adding a distinctive touch to the album. A noteworthy detail about Heretic is that is the inclusion of the song Born Again, which in fact is the outro guitar solo from the song secured limitations from the band's 2000 release Gateways to Annihilation. The album's track listing showcases its diverse versions with releases ranging from standard CD cases to limited edition box sets and picture discs. The variety in additions includes exclusive bonus content, such as the 18-track CD bonus levels and limited edition stickers, catering to different regions and collector preferences. These are very short tracks. So this is my note. These are very short tracks and like mostly instrumentals when you say 18 songs. Because I looked this up. I was looking everywhere. I was like, 18 songs? What the hell is going on with that? So it's just uh, a bunch of like weird little minuets and like added extra music and stuff. Like you can find it. And Heretic is like an orange cover, like statues on the front. And I don't, I'm not, wasn't really dove into this album much right. at all either. So, so it's an album or is it like a compilation of random bits? Because um, or is it both? Like, it's, it's kind it's of both. both. Okay. The bonus CD, 18 track, okay. is like the compilation, but it's an actual album. All right. All lyrics for Heretic are penned by Steve Tucker while the music is primarily composed by Trey Azektoth, except where noted. I also know I did listen to some of the Heretic. I might even have this, to be honest. But I feel like the recording itself, production, like since he didn't go to, they didn't go to the more sound recordings. Yeah. yeah. I just don't feel like it, the, rec- the production just, it's hard to listen to, really, you know, especially for what we do nowadays. Especially you know? for the standard that we hold them to. Yeah. So in 2004, Morbid Angel parted ways with Earache, leading to Steve Tucker's departure from the band once again. This paved the way for the return of former vocalist bassist David Vincent. I was so stoked for this to happen. And <laughs> Subsequently, the band continued its musical journey by embarking on tours, participating in, fi- participating in festivals, including the notable Wacken Wa- Open Air in 2006. Their appearance on various midsummer 2008 European festivals was framed as a short break from writing and pre-production on their new eighth studio album. In May 2008, it was revealed that Destructor from Zyklon would be the band's new guitarist, a key addition for the forthcoming album. 
On March 18, 2010, Morbid Angel announced that Tim Young would take on the drumming duties for the upcoming album, allowing Pete Sandoval time to recover from back surgery. The band entered the studio on June 22, 2010, initiating the recording process for their new full-length album. On March 5, 2011, Morbid Angel headlined the Scion Rock Fest in Pomona, California, marking their first U.S. performance in six years. Aside from a one-off show in Los Angeles in May 2009, subsequently, on March 9, 2011, Morbid Angel confirmed the title of their new album, Elud Divinium Insanus, which was released on June 7 via Season of the Miss. Notably, this album took a departure from the band's typical sound, incorporating electronic elements. I think we're just going to blast through this, bro. Yeah, we're going to yeah, just do yeah. this whole thing. Yeah, we're getting towards this, the end here. The second half of their career can be condensed a little bit. No diss on them. Um, they just had, they they had some, <laughs> they had some stumbles. Yeah, in, in, in that uh, fifteen years following, you know, uh, domination. So, and that's a great segue into Alu Divinium and Sanus. Big stumble here. Yeah. So it stands as the eighth studio album from Morbid Angel independently released by French label Season of Mist on June 7, 2011. This album marked the band's return after their longest hiatus between studio albums following Heretic in 2003. Elude Divinium Insanus featured guitarist Destructor and drummer Tim Young in their only collaboration with Morbid Angel, as well as the return of bassist vocalist David Vincent since rejoining in 2004. The album's genesis spans more than five years, with the initial work commencing in 2006. Originally slated for a 2007 release, it encountered multiple delays as the band juggled touring commitments and the creation of new material. Finally, materializing from June 2010 to January 2011, the album was crafted at various studios, including Mana Recording Studios, which is Eric Rutan's studio, Okay and Red Room Studios for drum recording, and D.O.W. Studios for bass guitars and vocals. Elude was mixed in Hollywood, California, under the guidance of Sean Bevin. Bevin. Gustavo Sazes, the Brazilian artist, Brazilian artist, unveiled the album's cover art on March 30th, 2010. Sazes described the concept as an organic, surreal, insane being, representing a departure from Morbid Angel's previous covers. The album's track listing and release details for various formats emerged on April 5, 2011. Leading up to the album launch, the single for Nevermore dropped on May 16, available digitally and on 7-inch vinyl, featuring cover art by French artists Valdnor and Fodorsi Kaiser or Metastasis. I don't even know what any it's of that like, means. Do your best. That's all yeah, we can do. I'm trying here, <laughs> folks. Thanks. Notably, the single included an exclusive remix of Destructos vs. Earth by Combi Christ. Okay. Um, I got to say, even though it's a change in artwork or provider of artwork, uh, it's a pretty cool album art, um, both the the original and the re-release. Um, I got to say, I like, I like the look of both of these as cover art. A little unique, a little different, right? I'm for it. Yeah. I'd have to re-see it again because um, I just remember it being like huge text on it for some reason. I yeah. Know, the, it recalls the left hand, The yeah. left-hand column is their logo and the uh, name of the album all chopped up, but it's still pretty cool. <clears throat> so the album's remix counterpart, Elude Divinium Insanus, the remix has surfaced in 2012. However, the album generated polarizing reviews, receiving criticism from fans and mixed reaction from critics. Described by some as a failed experiment and compared to Metallica's Saint Anger, <laughs> the album faced disapproval for its industrial elements. Metal Injection, offering a mere 3 out of 10 rating, labeled it as a joke and a bummer to listen to. <laughs> God damn it. Criticizing the absence of Pete Sandoval and David Vincent's lyrics, Blabbermouth echoed these sentiments, highlighting the program drums and uninspired tracks. Well, Blabbermouth's going to basically shit on anything, even if it's good. So yeah. you don't, you got to take that with a grain of salt. Metal Injection, I'll give them a little bit more credence there, but um, and that's a pretty low mark, yeah, from a band that listens or from a, a zine that listens to all the metal. <clears throat> So I should have did a little more diving into this. So when I heard this, it seemed like it was all like industrial and weird. So it's, so this is telling me there's a remix here 
and I should have dove into this a little more to get to the bottom of this the way I did with the other albums. I think I just brushed over this because what I did hear from this was garbage. Okay. But so it, can you look up and tell me, so there's an OG album, then there's a remixed one? Is that, so there's an, the allude is actually just metal shit and then... The other one is... No, the original has a lot of electronic okay. elements. So the, okay. what they probably did is they took and like Nine Inch Nails and oh, they okay. did like a whole remix of all the electronic okay. parts to just give the fans, hey, we can do it this way too, and nobody likes that shit. Yeah, that makes sense. So conversely, all music acknowledged the experimental nature of Elude viewing its departure from Morbid Angel's early sound. Metal Hammer praised it as a twisted confrontational masterpiece offering a notable 9 out of 10 rating. Notable metal artists, including Michael Elkerfeld El El from Opeth, expressed their anticipation and appreciation before the release. However, drummer Pete Sandoval will distance himself from the album, expressing dissatisfaction and, su and suggesting it could have been a separate project. Mm. Trey, the guitarist, termed the album a confused effort, acknowledging its role in David Vincent's departure in 2015. He offered no apologies for the computerized beats and effects, describing the track Radical as silly and having no involvement in its creation. In, December, in a December 2013 interview, David Vincent confirmed that Pete Sandoval was no longer a member of the band, citing Sandoval's embrace of religion and stating that he and Morbid Angel were no longer compatible. This revelation put the rest speculation about Sandoval's eventual return to the band. When asked about Morbid Angel's plans for 2015 in a December 2014 interview, Vincent responded, we're done touring for a while, it's time to write. Young added that the band was in discussions about recording an EP. On June 15, 2015, it was reported that David Vincent and Tim Young were no longer in Morbid Angel. Former vocalist bassist Steve Tucker shortly rejoined the band once again, while a replacement drummer, Scott Fuller, joined in 2017. Later that day, however, Vincent denied that he had left the band. On his official Facebook page, Tucker hinted in a post on June 17th that Destructor was no longer part of Morbid Angel either. Who will play the second guitar? Time will answer that one. On June 18th, this was confirmed, as Destructor announced his departure from the band to focus on the Norwegian death metal band. Erkskog. Yep. The next day, Vincent confirmed his departure due to creative differences. So one day he says, yeah, I'm, I, oh, I'm still in the band. Then the next day he's like, wait, I'm not in the band. Okay. Both he and Young teamed up together in 2016 to form the band I Am Morbid. On August 3rd, Morbid Angel was signed to UDR Music and was at work on a new studio album, which would be released in 2017 with a tour to follow. So yeah, before we get into this last little bit, just so you guys know, there's a Morbid Angel out there, and then there's the I Am Morbid. Yeah. I'm not real sure with the catalog. Luckily, I got to see Morbid Angel about 10 years ago now, but at least I got to see them. Mm -hmm. Tim Young was on drums. Steve Tucker was on bass. They played all the great songs, all the hits. You know, it, it was great. I don't know who their second guitar was, was, so I actually got to see them. It was awesome. But no, I didn't get to see them on that tour for Pantera because we got there late and missed them. I was kind of pissed because that was like the band I wanted to see. Right. I didn't give a fuck about Scrape and Static X was cool, but they were so unmemorable that when you talk about that concert, I don't even remember seeing them. Right. Um, so I missed my chance to see them, but it, like a few years later, they played with some cool bands down in Chicago and I went down there. But this I Am Morbid thing, I know there's a lot of leather, a lot of eyeliner. I've seen that. Not real sure where that... <laughs> I've seen the photos. They're looking like some Motley boys. I don't know what's going on here. Ugh. But I'm assuming they're playing some Morbid Angel tracks that maybe in the Vincent era. I don't know much about it. I think it's kind of weird. It's kind of like they're a it's, tribute band. I'm not yeah, real sure what's going on. We've, but I, I feel like we've seen this sort of thing play out in history where, you, like, like let's take Queensryche, for example, and Jeff Tate leaves the band and even has the nerve to form a Queensryche of his own mm. until legal matters get involved. But yeah, you get him out there on the road doing Queensryche material and probably only the Jeff Tate era stuff, obviously. Yeah. But um, we've seen it time and again where a singer or a former member will go out on the road and use the band name in some form or fashion to garner the attention of fans and say, hey, I'm doing Morbid Angel. It's called I Am Morbid. Mm. And, you know, it's... <sighs> 
and it is what it is. You got to go out there and make a living, and I'm sure that's kind of what was working for him at the time. But it's it's a bit of a slap in the face to the fans to go out there and give like half an effort. You know, you got White Lion out there without you know their guitarist. You know, so you can't do that anymore. You got to say nope, we're not doing it as White Lion because we don't have our awesome guitarist whose name escapes me. But God, is he good? Um, uh, Vito Brava, no Vito. Uh, anyway, so you get you get this sort of thing happening all the time where yeah. somebody leaves the band and they're going to continue touring on some form or fashion of the name, and it's it's not what you want to serve your fans. Just give them something more authentic. Well, even now we kind of have that weird thing where we have the two death tribute bands, the Death to All and the Left to Die. Yeah, I mean, and so I, Left to Die is like everything up school. to leprosy, yeah, and then like Death to All is everything. That's progressive, basically. So, so, so the left to die, I get, and also the um, death to all is that just depends on who's participating, right? right? So you get guys from Cynic in there, and so they're going to do like the human era and individual thought pattern stuff, and the left to die, like you said, strictly like the first two albums, yeah. right? Um, I think I th- through I, leprosy, yeah, and I think yeah. it's I think it's cool to go out there and honor Chuck, but I still haven't made. I don't know how I feel about it. Like I don't know that we saw Chuck. Yeah. I don't. I don't see any reason why I would go out there and see Death to All. Um, I'll continue to always support Death and and put hold them to the highest regard. But it's just going to be hard for me to go out there and see somebody else sing Chuck's life work yeah. back to me. Yeah. Um, and same with uh, Morbid Angel. If it's not going to have Trey on stage, I don't know that I really want to see anybody else play Morbid Angel. That's just my personal opinion. <clears throat> All right. Cool. Let's um. We're at about a 130 mark right now, so we'll we'll just kind of try to wrap this up here at sure. a decent time. So ending with I Am Morbid, David Vinson leaving the band. So on January 9th, 2017, Trey Toth announced on his Facebook page that Scott Fuller from Annihilated joined Morbid Angel for the recording of their new album. Additional details indicated that the album title would presumably start with the letter K, given the band's history on naming their albums alphabetically. The next day, the band announced that they had hired Dan Bad, Dan Vietam Vaughn from Van D. De- <laughs> okay, Van Dietam Vaughn is their second guitarist, so that's... Uh, Named the band after himself? Yeah, okay. John Bon Jovi in this motherfucker. <laughs> so they also... <laughs> They also announced a U.S. tour with Suffocation, Revocation, and Withered. Mm. Cool fucking tour. Yeah. Which would begin in late May and continue into late June. In a March interview on the Metal Magdalene with Jet show on Metal Messiah Radio, God damn, that's a mouthful, Steve Tucker explained that the album would be a death metal album. Mm. When speaking to Orlando Weekly in May 2017, Tucker said that the tour set list would not feature any David Vincent era material and would then perform songs featuring him instead. He also said that they would probably play one or two new songs from the new album, in which he said that it was almost done, but we don't want to put out too much with YouTube putting it up the next day. On the opening night on May 23rd, they performed a new song entitled Warped. Orbit Angel canceled their, canceled their European appearance twice due to passport issues from one of the members. The band's management explained that a new passport would not be issued in time for the shows. The band expressed disappointment with the news and issued an apology. On October 5th, the cover artwork for the forthcoming album titled Kingdom's Disdain was revealed, which was released on December 1st by Silver Lining Music. Later that day, the brand new song Piles of Little Arms was made available for streaming, followed by For No Master on November 29th. The album's title serves as a sonic chronicle of the world descending into uncharted despair, a revelation shared by Tucker. He said that the accompanying artwork provides a poignant reflection of the contemporary world, albeit from a distinctive vantage point, that the dominant gods who engineered our reality and are now slowly stirring from slumber. In tandem with Tucker's interpretation, Trey Azektoth, in a conversation with Revolver, discusses a connection to the 1980s animated series Thondar the Barbarian. Tucker Delving into the essence of the album, paints it as possessing a big, grandiose vibe that transcends the bounds of ordinary existence. What captivates him most is the raw and intense nature of the music, which despite its ferocity manages to resonate with the zeitgeist. 
He perceives a timely alignment with contemporary world, a sentiment that echoes the album's authenticity. Reflecting on the album's creation pro pro process, Tucker shares Trey's initial directive. Quote, I want to make killer music with killer people. Beyond this, specifics blur in Tucker's memory, yet with the essence remains clear. A determination to preserve, pers preserve the authentic Morbid Angel sound. Tucker emphasizes the pivotal role of music, musical direction, asserting that it shapes the core identity of the project. Through conversations with Trey, Tucker found assurance that the album would stay true to Morbid Angel's legacy and expectations. Um, I have to agree. They did just that. They, they released a killer project, or a killer album in Kingdoms Disdained. Yeah, I think it's great. Yeah. I think it's heavy as shit. It's, it's raw. Yeah. It's it's the death metal that I want to hear from Morbid Angel, and they definitely return to fashion uh, with that one. So Tucker, alongside Azek Toth and Fuller, actively contribute to the songwriting. Their lyrical inspiration emerges from social events that are occurring through time repeatedly, a distinctive aspect in its third-person perspective providing an observer's lens on these events. The lyrics strive for neutrality, serving as objective observations rather than subjective narratives. In the essence, the collaborative effort of Tuck Tucker, Adiktoff, and Fuller materialize into an album that not only captures the essence of Morbid Angel, but also mirrors the unsettling pulse of contemporary societal occurrence. The authenticity of their approach, guided by Tucker's insistence on musical integrity, ensures a resonant and genuine musical experience for both the band and its devoted fan base, as we just alluded to. Kingdom's disdain garnered widespread acclaim, marking a triumphant return from Morbid Angel following the contentious Elude, Davidium, and Sinus chapter in their musical journey. Critics landed the album's departure from the industrial-influenced style of its predecessor, hailing it as a resurgence of the band's traditional death metal roots reminiscent of Formulas Fatal to the Flesh and Heretic. I almost feel like it kind of goes with some of those, but it's really with the gateways and domination. There's a lot of... I think there's a lot of things going on there that it really sounds like Morbid Angel. Yeah. So Steve Tucker's return as bassist vocalist earned praise from Exclaim, emphasizing his noteworthy performance. Guitarist Trey Azektal took center stage, describing as the album's standout element by showcasing the familiar crushing heaviness and forward-thinking technical intricacies that define his impeccable songwriting. Pitchfork asserted that Kingdom's Disdain steers Morbid Angel back on course, attributing its success to return to a more traditional death metal sound. Metal Hammer held the album as streamlined, grandiose, and utterly complete, singling out Azektal for particular acclaim. Re the review emphasized his unparalleled, unparalleled, unparalleled. Jeez, why can't I speak now? We're almost done with this, and I <laughs> fucking can't talk. <laughs> Mastery in wielding the demonic spirit of death metal with unmatched power. Morgan Y. Evans of MetalRiot.com reassured fans by noting that despite initial concerns from the cover art, the record maintains an old-school essence, offering the brutal heft and intensity that morbid angel enthusiasts crave. What's up, who, buddy? who the fuck has a problem with this cover art is what I want to know, because that cover art is badass. Yeah, I, don't, I don't know, maybe because it's so... It's not arty. It's almost like it's it's like somewhere computerized, you know. Let me like, have a let me refresh my memory here. So like, we got kingdoms, disdain. There we go, and it looks somewhere between like a painting and and yeah, the like a glossed over kind of computerized image. This web page is having the hardest time loading, but I love the cover art, and I how dare anybody knock this is a great death metal fucking cover i just i'm in love with it yeah i thought it was cool yeah i mean I and that is that is morbid angel all day with that i don't i don't appreciate his anybody's negative remarks on that cover art man they're i will send them to the guy on the cover <laughs> <laughs> fuck that, that yeah is, i thought it was sweet too it's great album art okay so however not all reviews were equally positive sputnik music cr critique kingdoms disdain for losing momentum in the second half attributing this downturn to prolonged tracks with minimal highlights that highlighted a divide between the lengthier, more repetitive songs lacking Azic Toss legendary solos and the sharp, concise, high-tempo riff fest found in the album's better moments. Additionally, Sputnik Music suggested a perceived lack of distinctive personality compared to Morbid Angel's previous records. 
Decibel acknowledged the album's no compromise sound, praising its efforts to recapture the essence of earlier releases. However, they expressed concern about the lack of diversity among the tracks, asserting that while minds might not be blown, listeners would merely be satiated. In the tapestry of critical reception, Kingdom's disdain emerges as a powerful testament to Morbid Angel's resilience and their reclamation of Death Metal Throne. Morbid Angel toured the U.S. in the spring of 2018 with Misery Index and Origins, promoting on separate legs. Two additional bands, Dreaming Dead and Hate Storm Annihilation, were added as additional support. In 2019, Morbid Angel and Cannibal Corpse toured together for the first time ever promoted by heavy metal magazine Decibel with Necrot and Blood Incantation as additional support. A couple of badass tours there. <laughs> yeah, no shit. Immolation replaced Cannibal Corpse for the final week of the tour. Some more death metal powerhouses there. Yeah. In February 2019 interview with Metal Wani, Tucker stated that Morbid Angel was planning to begin working on a new album that year. Quote, I'm going to actually start writing some new music, and I think Trey will probably start writing some new music. We'll probably do a couple more tours through the year. We'll have some stuff that's being talked about now, but nothing concrete. It's that time. So it's been a little bit over the years since the last album came out. I've kind of got that urge and desire myself to write some more music. So we'll start getting into that and continue doing shows. In March 2019, Morbid Angel appeared on the Adult Swim television series, Fist Center Live. On September, on September 27, 2019, it was made public that former Morbid Angel guitarist Richard Brunell passed away on September 23rd at age 55. The cause of death remains unknown. Too young. Also, they said something earlier. I had mentioned that it was like maybe some kind of substance abuse is why he left the band. So, yeah, you know, I don't want to speculate on the guy's death. R.I.P., you played your role in death metal history, and, you know, hopefully you lived out a good, healthy life. But, you know, it's... 55 is too early to go. And then, again, and we will take a brief moment here to let the listeners know that if you have a substance abuse problem, this is what you can expect. My dad, corrections officer, offered me this. The road you're going down, you're going to die or end up in prison. And here I stand before you to say I chose to do neither of those things, and I would hope the same for y'all. Yeah. 55 is way too young. You should be able to at least add 20 more years to that and 20 enjoyable years yes. to that. So if you're struggling out there, know that you got a couple of guys here who get it, especially I will speak for myself. Um slide into a dm i'll help you out because i'm here for you like that i don't want to see anybody going into the ground i would rather have a 20 minute conversation with you about kicking the habit than read your eulogy or obituary the next day so yeah and please reach out get the help that you need to get because it can be a tough thing to deal with habits and yeah substance abuse we're not here to ride a high horse or tell anybody or what they should do a virtue signal but we really hope that we would like to see all of you guys especially if you're listening to our show we want to see you live long and healthy lives and enjoy metal to the end, right? Yeah, no doubt. Yeah, there's a lot more to life than, than those things, and, yeah. and there's a lot of help out there for you. So in celebration of their 40th anniversary, Morbid Angel embarked on a five-week North American tour called the United States Tour of Terror, Terror in March through April 2013. During the March 31st, 2013 show in Belvedere, Illinois, the roof of the concert venue collapsed after it was struck by an EF one tornado resulting in the death of one concert goer and the injuries to at least 40 others noted that the crypto was on the show as well you had mentioned that before when you said that you missed crypto and that was probably one of the shows you was going to try to go to yeah it was on a date that i could have made it to i just i didn't for whatever reason i didn't take the time or the you know the it just wasn't going to be something that worked out over all end of day for me. Um, I would have been in that crowd. I would have been right there in that crowd. So that's a very scary thing to have happen. Uh, you never want to, you never think you're going to leave your house going to a concert and it's going to be your last day on earth. So definitely a sad day for Morbid Angel and that, that family. So rest in peace to that concert goer. So just a thing to note, we're wrapping this thing up right now. So that's kind of the last of Morbid Angel. They were playing some shows. Last I knew in 2023, they mm-hmm. were playing. Yep. Right? Yep. yep. They were on but tour. But there was a show in April that Trey actually collapsed on stage, and mm-hmm. they had to cancel the rest of the show. I don't know what happened, and I don't want to speculate because I think that's most of the information out there. It was on April 21st in Tampa, Florida. Yeah. So I, I don't know... 
they played six songs and then he had collapsed uh, during the or they were going to play uh, no he collapsed during the fifth song excuse me mm-hmm. um so whatever's going on there it he, said he was suffering from a back injury yeah he he might have been medicating on that and just unable to stay stay on his feet that day with all other things going on um whatever was going on and without further speculation i will say i hope trey's getting better and i hope he's getting the help that he needs because i think um he's still got some rifts in him especially just looking at the work of kingdom sustained i would hope that there's another morbid angel to build on the success of that album and i look forward to it it's been some years we had a whole pandemic between then and now lots of time still touring so i'm i'm looking forward to them at least giving us one more let's take it to letter l please and, yeah. and see uh, and see what we get out of them. So a few things to note here, just at the end of the Morbid Angel. Thank you guys if you stuck with us this whole time. Hopefully you learned some things and you're a fan of Morbid Angel before and after this as well. Or if you've never heard of them, maybe you uh, want to go look at some of their albums. Yeah. Start with Domination. Yeah, start with Domination and then see where you go from there. But, you know, Morbid Angel stands a, as a pivotal force in the evolution of death metal, yeah, leaving yeah. the mark of its beast in the genre alongside Cannibal Corpse. Noteworthy is former guitarist Eric Rutan's venture into the successful death metal realm with Hate Eternal and the ascent of South Carolina's Nile. Yeah, both bands are very reflective of the, uh, excuse me, the Morbid Angel sound. Achieving significant success within a similar death metal paradigm. Beyond the shores of North America, Morbid Angel's sonic influence reverberates in the growth of the evolution of death and black metal in South America and the early Norwegian black metal scene. I know there were some bands that we had alluded to. They were fans of Morbid Angel. Maybe not when they got on the major label, but I knew they were influenced by them, especially yeah. with the satanic imagery and the weird occult stuff that they were portraying in their death metal. They yeah. just Black metal was a completely different sound, right? Yeah, and the, the early albums especially, yes. So a plethora of bands spanning Obituary, Immortal, Crisian, Gorgots, Behemoth, Dead Congregation, Gojira, Opeth, Piron, Revocation, and many others cite Morbid Angel as a profound influence in their music trajectory. Our buddies in the band Pain Divine also talked about that on the show, so you can go listen to their episode as well. Oh, yeah. Their early releases, Ab- Abominations of Desolation and Altars of Madness, are hailed as pioneering examples of death metal, pushing boundaries and setting the standard for extremity during their time. Metal Sucks recognizes their impact, named Morbid Angel as one of the most important bands of the 1990s, emphasizing the seminal albums Blessed Are the Sick, Committed, and Domination. The band's visibility captured the help with the help of Beavis and Butthead, turning them into the death metal ambassadors, introducing countless youths to the genre. Yeah. So even myself, that's why I said, what's, yeah. uh, you know, I... That's where I found out about Morbid Angel. Yeah. It wasn't until later when you and I started getting into more death metal and, you know, when I was hanging out with the Broadway crew and they were playing Covenant all the time. That was the one they jammed yeah. all the time. We were in the domination, yeah. but we were a little more highbrow with our musical taste just because of us and, playing music too, and, you know? And just a little bit younger too, where, the yeah. uh, you know, our our friends at the time, a few years older than us, they were obviously going to be hip to some of the stuff that came just before all that. So, guitarist Trey Azektoth emerges as a luminary figure, earning a spot among Loudwire's top 10 rock and metal's riff lords, described as leaving his fingerprints on the early death metal scene. Azektoth's con- unconventional style, as VH1 notes, mirrors the adventurous spirit of Eddie Van Halen, influencing bands like Hey Eternal and Nile. Azektoth's guitar prowess, described as shredding and resembling Slayer's intensity, creates a tension filled style that takes the listener into a mystical realm he terms the Temple of Ostex. The band's association with overly satanic and occult themes drew attention during the 90s death metal scare, featuring in news reports due to their lyrical and visual choices, alluding back to the satanic panic. So it kind of worked out, and they were getting some press that probably wasn't... I mean, I guess... Some press was better than no press, right? So I mean, and if I'm sitting in Morbid Angel's shoes w- during the Satanic Panic, I'm laughing the whole way. Oh yeah, like, I'm just sure. like, thanks yeah. for the free promo, right, or the free exactly. uh, advertisements yeah. there. Thank you very much. <laughs> so musically, Morbid Angel Journey is characterized by harsh growled vocals, technically complex gu- guitar work, and Pete Sandola's influential drumming, marked by double bass speed and technical proficiency. The band's style has evolved with anti-Christian lyrical themes transitioning from early straightforward blasphemy to more philosophical and thought-provoking expressions. 
On albums like Covenant, Morbid Angel broadens their lyrical scope, expressing anti-theistic sentiments and anger at a higher power. Present-day lyricist Trey delves into blasphemous yet non-traditional ide- ideology, offering a lyrical depth and reflects the band's evolution over the years. In essence, Morbid Angel's journey is a testament to their enduring impact on global metal landscape. So, with that being said, they're out there. They're still doing their thing. Yeah. Might see some new music from them. I know this was a, a long episode, but I figured, why not just, we're here, we're sitting here, let's jam yeah. it into one instead of making two. Yeah, well, the back we'll end had of their- the- the back end isn't as interesting as getting up to right. f- maybe formulas. Yeah. And then and then you've got like a lot of missed albums that aren't really great. They they don't hold up to the standard of domination or covenant. And it it's look, not every album is gonna be better than the last. Right. And sometimes you gotta grow and do something different. But they are still out there doing the thing. I hope Trey is getting well from the tour. I know that tour was not was not a good time for him and the and them as a band by all accounts in the media what i read it was a troublesome tour not just you know n- so two things at least right you got the roof caving in mm. and then you've got Trey falling down on stage yeah. collapsing and calling it an early night so hopefully they're able to kind of regroup get it together get healthy put out a new album and tour again because they are still kings of death metal and i want to see morbid angel on tour i don't care how old these dudes are now if they can still bring it to the stage i need to get out there and see them because i have not yet i've missed several opportunities over the years whatever reason scheduling money location doesn't matter i haven't made it out to them and uh i'm glad i didn't make it out to the one right you know so they're on your bucket list yeah they're definitely on my bucket list and i i'm gonna say steve tucker you know you're the man so i'm counting on you to help get trey on his feet (laughs) And get them on the stage and get that album out because um, I have nothing but praise for you. End of day, even if there's a couple albums in there that I'm not crazy about or I need to dive back into and learn more about, the body of work speaks for itself. And I'm I'm here to tell you that Morbid Angel is a term or a band name that we all know for very good reason. They've put out a huge body of awesome work. Um, the beginnings of death metal, obviously, they're there, but they're still here and they're still influential and they're still writing music that sounds like morbid angel um so definitely everybody go check them out you can start with kingdoms if you want yeah but i highly recommend domination yep. i usually work from the newest going backwards and that's yeah. fair but i'm also here to tell you that 95's domination is yep. probably the, probably the in my opinion the best you're going to get and then everything else is is going to come in um you know just slightly under that depending on what we're talking about but yeah um Horns up to Morbid Angel, and and thank you, Jason, for the work on the bio and and educating us on everything and all things Morbid Angel. Oh, yeah. With that being said, keep it metal. Peace. Thank you so much for checking out the episode. Be sure to hit that like button and give us a share. Yeah, and if you enjoyed our podcast today, please give it a rating on your streaming service to help us gain some exposure. And if you really enjoyed the show, please give us a follow or hit that subscribe button and come hang out with us every week. And remember, keep it metal.